Acts chapter 1, verse 5, and we're going to go through verse 8. Now John truly baptized with water, but Jesus said, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So the first thing I want to point out is John baptized people unto repentance, not unto salvation. He baptized them unto repentance. That means turning away from their sin. But there's only one who saves, and that's Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. We're going to get into that. But the word baptizo in the Greek means to dip or to immerse. Okay? So God literally, when we get born again, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. It's all throughout Scripture. Okay? I know there are people who claim a second experience. I believe it's just another power, another uh, infilling of the Holy Spirit as we move in obedience to Him. I believe that as we're walking with Christ, we're going to continue to feel His power. We're going to continue to get strength. We're going to continue to walk in His truth. But there is really one baptism into the body of Christ. And I'm going to prove that to you tonight in Scripture. So we're going to go on here. In verse 6 it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked the Lord, saying, Will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And He said to them, and boy, he's saying this to us too. It is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Praise God. So verse 5, we are commanded to be baptized with water. Yes, we are. That's the first part of it. John baptized with water. So water baptism, if you really want to read a great story, you can read Acts chapter 8. And I'm just going to summarize it for you. Philip was having a great revival in Samaria. People were getting saved. Demons were getting cast out. People were getting healed. Who wants to leave something like that? And here he is in Samaria, so it's a place where there's uh, some water, there's some greenery, there's, it's a beautiful area. And this revival is going on, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit speaks to Philip and says, run out into the desert by way of Gaza. And if you look that up on a map of Israel, it's literally heading into the desert, into the sand. And so who would want to leave like a, a, a place of comfort where there's greenery and people are getting saved? Who wants to leave a revival to run out to Taft? Amen? So that's what God said for Philip to do, run out in the desert. So he ran out in the desert, and the Bible says when he ran out there, he saw this person in a chariot. He was a eunuch, uh, Candace, the queen of Ethiopia's treasurer. And he had gone to Jerusalem in order to take a, a tithe and an offering to Jerusalem to give to the Lord's work. And he was on his way returning in the chariot. And Philip happened to listen to what the Holy Spirit was saying. Run and join yourself to this man. And so when he ran and joined himself, this is all in Acts chapter 8, the last, the last part of the chapter. He ran up to the chariot and he heard this man reading out of the book of Isaiah, particularly chapter 53. So he ran up next to him and said, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch who was sitting in the chariot said, how can I, except some man guide me? Well, that makes total sense. God has given gifts to the church, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles, to help us to learn these things. That's why he's given us these gifts. And so God pours through those people. It's not their knowledge, it's God's knowledge, but he just pours it through like a funnel so that we can grow. So he said, how can I, except some man guide me? And he invited Philip up into the chariot. So Philip went up into the chariot, and as they were riding along their way, the Bible said Philip explained to him all about Jesus, and that this prophecy in Isaiah 53 was all about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so after he preached this to him, they came to a body of water, probably some little pool somewhere in the desert, and this eunuch said, what's stopping me from being baptized? Great question. Philip said, do you believe? 
And he said, I believe with all my heart. In other words, I believe Jesus is the Lord that you're telling me about. So the Bible says they both stepped out of the chariot. They both went down into the water. And here comes the blessing of being obedient to Christ. As they came out of the water, the Bible says Philip was caught away to a little town in the desert called Azotus. So I did a study on Azotus. And if you're in the desert of Gaza, it's about... 27 to 30 miles away from that place. Okay, some Bible uh, commentaries say 40 miles. It doesn't matter. 27 or 40, it's still a long walk. But the Bible says Philip was caught away to Azotus and the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way. So he was literally translated 27 to 40 miles into this city. But you got to think about the circumstances. What was going on with this? Well, first of all, he just came out of the water. So he's dripping wet. And then when you consider the fact that he went to Azotus, Azotus is a, a desert town that has no water. They have to walk up the hill to a spring, get their water out of water pots, and bring it back to the city. So you, can you imagine this man walking down the middle of the streets of Azotus, uh, dripping wet, and people walking up and saying, where did you get the water? How, where are you taking a bath? And, and he being able to witness to them. In fact, the scripture says, Philip went from there through all the cities of Samaria and preached the gospel. So... He continued with that revival, but God gave him a supernatural experience of being sent. That's like being sent from here to San Luis Obispo, like that quick. <laughs> okay, You know he talked about that. You know he shared that with other people, that man, I was in the middle of the desert, and all of a sudden I was in a Zotus. And I got witnesses because they saw me dripping wet. So it's an amazing thing that God does when... We're obedient to what he asks us to do. So I would like to say this, that I've been going to this church now for almost eight years. In November, it'll be eight years, okay? So I've been pastoring this church for a little over four. March of 2020 was, or March of this last year was four. So I've been pastoring for four and a half years here, but I've been here eight years. And because I was an elder in the church, I knew about the finances of this church. And we had a guy who was kind of in charge of the finances, who was very frugal with the money of the church. I've been very liberal with fixing things, doing things, improving things. I've tried to do everything I could so that our church can be beautiful, okay? And I'm not worried about spending any money because where God guides, God provides, amen? So we have way more than we've ever had in this church uh, fund. We have a benevolence fund now that is able to help people that are hurting. We, Marcia, you sent me that little thing today, and I just wanted to let you know, I don't talk about money much, but I was shocked when I got Marcia's report about how much we have in our church fund. It is unbelievable how God has blessed this church financially, and that can only be for one reason. God is pleased with what's happening here. He is pleased with what's happening here, especially in our denomination where I've heard some churches are struggling so bad they're afraid that they're going to have to close their doors. And I believe that God blessed us for being obedient to his call to not forsake the gathering of ourselves together. So I just praise the Lord. It has nothing to do with me or anything else. It has everything to do with just us being obedient to our God. Amen? So speaking of that, in verse 5, we are commanded to be baptized with water. So I want to put this plea out. If you've been saved, but you've never been baptized, I encourage you to be baptized. It's really the first step of obedience in walking with Jesus Christ. And I, I, I was visiting your mom today, Steve, and uh, she's, she was the first Christian lady I ever, first Christian person I ever sat next to in church. And she asked me if I was saved. And after she was convinced that, yes, I had truly accepted Christ, the next thing was, you need to be baptized. And I made the excuse that when I was a little baby in the Greek Orthodox Church, I was baptized. I even had pictures. And I have a Greek certificate signed by Arch Archbishop Makarios that says I was baptized. And she said, that will never do. 
Because babies don't know what they're doing. And you can't, you know, if that were the case, why don't we just quit church, go out and throw everybody in the ocean? You know, it's not about that. It's about a willing decision to give a public testimony in front of other believers to show them what's happened in my heart. I want to show you physically. In the water, when I'm standing in the water, I'm, I'm identifying myself with Jesus on the cross. I'm dying to my old self. When I go under the water, it's a picture of me dying to my old man, being buried. And then when I come up out of the water, it's a picture of the resurrection to a new life in Jesus Christ. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. It's a, it's, a, it's a photograph of what's already happened in our heart. So obedience is not a choice. Obedience is something we're commanded to obey the Lord. So Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus, the last words he said in instructing the church, the believers in Christ, Jesus came and spoke to them, Matthew 28, 18, and said, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Let's remember that tonight. There's people who think they have all power. God has all power. He is in control of everything. Even though there's people that think they have all the power, God holds the breath of every man in his hand, and the Lord can do this anytime he wants. And that's the end of that. He did it to Herod, who stood up and made a speech. And the people said, it's the voice of a God. And he kind of bowed and took the credit. And the Bible says God smote him with worms, which in the Greek is the Greek word skolex, which means maggots. And he was eaten up immediately. He gave up the ghost. God just said, maggots on you, boom. Why? Because Isaiah 42.8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to any man. Neither will I give my praise to graven images. God gets all the glory. God gets all the praise. He's the one that works through us to do the things that he's doing on this earth. And he has all power. He says, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's an interesting uh, correlation here in this verse. Typically, in the English language, you would say baptizing them in the names of Joe and Steve and Jack. That would be proper English, in the names. That's three names. But he said, notice he said baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's one name. That's one God and one name. Okay, And then he said, verse 20, teaching them to observe or obey all things whatsoever I have commanded you to do, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, which is another signal that we're going to be with Jesus all the way to the end. He's not going to lock us in some room. We're going to be with him all the way for eternity now. He's never going to leave us ever. So, and then Matthew chapter 3 gives us the example of Jesus himself, because I don't believe Jesus commands us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do. So, in Matthew chapter 3, starting with verse 13, the Bible says Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized of him. So, here we have God in the flesh coming to show the example of what he wants all of his people to do who believe in him. And John forbid him. John resisted and said, I have need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Allow it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, John, this is the way that we will show that we're righteous before God. This is an outward sign of something that's happened inwardly. Okay? He, then he allowed him. And I, I can show you this in Ezekiel chapter 36, where God originally came up with this plan. Okay? So Jesus, when he, was straight, when he was baptized, he went straightway up out of the water. So now God tells us how to be baptized. He shows us that we have to be in water. Well, Jesus was in the grave, so it makes perfect sense that we have to be submersed like Jesus was, and then be resurrected out of the water. So he said... 
He came straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And then there was a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So God is really well pleased when we obey him. So let's take a look at Ezekiel 36. And I know that's not in your notes, but I just try to really follow what the Lord's trying to tell me to say when we're doing these teachings. So the book of Ezekiel 36, and starting with verse 25. Verse 25 says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. So what's the water a picture of? The blood. God is going to sprinkle His blood upon us just like they sprinkled the blood on the, on the uh, altar of holiness in, in, uh, in the temple. They sprinkled the blood and fire came down and consumed the blood. So God says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And then I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put inside you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a new heart of flesh. And then I'll put my spirit in you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So God talks about three things. Being washed in the blood, being cleansed from our filthiness, and then receiving the Holy Spirit so that we have the ability to follow the Lord. We can't do that in the flesh. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Because without me, you can do nothing. So if we religiously try to follow God without the Holy Spirit, we're going to fail. We're going to fail every time. We even fail now that we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to do what God asks us to do. Okay, so the end part of this verse speaks of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's different than water baptism. This is actually the fifth time that the phrase baptized with the Holy Spirit occurs. It's four times in the Gospels. So if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 11. So the scripture says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John the Baptist speaking. But he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not even worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. So now we understand that Jesus is the baptizer. Amen? We get baptized, but he's the one that baptizes us. And then Mark chapter 1 and verse 8 And, and you know, we can't take credit for that. I've heard people say, praise God, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. Why are you bragging? Jesus did that. That had nothing to do with you. That had everything to do with Jesus bringing you into the body of Christ. Matthew, Mark chapter 1 and verse 8 says, I indeed have baptized you with water. This is John the Baptist again speaking. But he, that's Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Okay? And then Luke chapter 3 and verse 16. Luke 3, 16, John answered and said unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not even worthy to unloose. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then John chapter 1 and verse 33. And the Bible says by two or three witnesses every word will be established. So there it is. There's four witnesses. John 1 and verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending. So now John saw the Spirit descending on him too. Amen? Amen. Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, that same is he who baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Now, I've seen people try to, quote, get people baptized in the Holy Ghost by trying to push them down and all this other stuff. The fact of it is, 
When you get saved, you are baptizo, you are dipped into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. So I, I want to prove that to you in Scripture. Uh, the fifth time was, of course, in verse 5 of Acts chapter 1. So, the phrase baptized with the Holy Spirit is found in the Greek, baptizi, which is translated, it is an action which was to take place at one particular time, once and for all, Spiritual baptism is an event which attaches every genuinely repentant believer to the body of Christ. So we have a membership here in this church. And the membership just simply states you're willing to be faithful and help support the work of God here. And there's a lot of things that uh, are listed in that as far as we, we believe in the visible coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the rapture. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. We believe in the blood of Christ. We believe all the things that we all believe. And then to be a member is just simply making a vow that you're going to pray for this church and that you're going to support the ministry here. Okay? I have no idea who supports this ministry. I told Marcia when I first became pastor, I don't want to know. I don't want to know who gives. I've had pastors say, well, don't you know if your elders give or not? That's none of my business. That's between them and God. God says we ought to give out of a cheerful heart, out of what God has prospered us. I'm not going to go around and check on people to see if they're giving or not. That's crazy. They're not giving to the church anyway. They're giving to God. Isn't that a personal issue? I mean, so again... It's none of my business. We have an administrator. We have a head elder who look after the finances of the church. All I need to know is can I write a check? You know, there's something going on here that needs to be taken care of. Do we have enough to cover that or not? And then they tell me yay or nay, and whatever they tell me, I do. But other than that, it doesn't matter to me. Because I know from experience where God guides, God provides He has proven himself to me over and over and over and over again. All we have to do is follow. Where where we follow Jesus, he'll he'll make room. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians. You can't twist the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. And, And if we don't get through this tonight, we got notes. We can go through the rest of it next week. But I, but I really want to make this clear because there's so much confusion about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's all kinds of signs of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. I think the first sign is love. The love of God. I mean, I know when I first got saved, God baptized me in the Holy Spirit. I was saved that night. I know that because the next morning I was at war with my neighbor across the street. And every morning we used to threaten each other. And I got up and looked across the street. He was walking out of his house. And this love just fell all through me. And I literally went, hey, Raul, good morning. And he fell back inside of his house and slammed the door. He was shocked to death. So was I. God's first sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the love of God. That's the first sign. There are other signs as well. But I don't want to major or minor on any signs because we're all different as the scripture points out here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 starting with verse 4. The reason there's 2 Corinthians because the Corinthian church was a very gifted church. Paul had to write to them twice and straighten them out. They were so in the flesh about so many things and bragging about, I have this and you have that and I'm of Paul and he's of Apollos. And Paul just continually had to rebuke them and tell them, this is the way it should be. So in 1 Corinthians 12, by the way, 12 and 14 cover the spiritual gifts. But you know what's in the middle? 13. You know what 13 talks about? Love. 13 is the love chapter. He wants us to understand that the central part of being a believer is to love. And I've been accused of not loving people. You're far too harsh. You you just keep repeating things. Hey, if I didn't love people, I wouldn't tell them the truth. Man, I would want to build a huge, uh, you know, glory to myself and get as many people as I wanted to get in here so that I could say, look what I've done. It's not about me. It's not about anything I do. It's about Jesus. And it's about getting the sheep from point A to point B, which is heaven. That's what it's all about. 
is to make sure that all of us get to there at the same time. We don't want to leave any sheep behind. So 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Now there are differences, of or diversities of gifts, but it's the same spirit. In other words, we all have a different gift. Hey, I would love to stand up here and play an instrument. I've already tried that. I just am not good at that. I played clarinet in junior high, and I did okay with that, but I've tried guitar. It hurts my fingers. I've tried piano. My fingers are too big. I can't get them to work right. So I just gave it up and said, I'll just preach. We'll let somebody else have that gift, and somebody else have the gift of giving. And I know some people who are incredibly wealthy, and their gift is to help the work of God. So everybody has a different gift. I've met people that I dearly love in the rest home. You know what their gift is? Probably one of the most important ones in the body of Christ. To pray for others. A, a selfless gift of just spending my time building others up. There's all kinds of gifts. So he says there's differences of gifts, but it's the same spirit. And there's differences of administrations or operations. See, did you know that Jesus healed people in the Bible who were blind four different ways? I preached in a church one time up in Northern California, and, and the pastor said, can you come up here and share? I had let him share when I was in Avila Beach, so he said, can you come up and share? I have a congregation who wants to do things just this way and no other way. They're stuck in a rut, and they won't get out of it. So I preached on the four different ways that Jesus healed blind people. And I said, our problem is, is we find something that's comfortable and we just want to stay in that groove and wear it out. If it's not working anymore, change it. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus healed people. One time he spit in the sand. What optometrist would ever spit in dirt and put it on people's eyes? Okay? I mean, think about that. And then another one, he just touched them. There was four different ways, and I'll probably preach on that sometime just so you can see all four. But my end of my message was, don't stay in a rut. Change is good. It's not comfortable, but it's really good. We have to keep moving. A river keeps moving. The Dead Sea is dead because it doesn't move. It doesn't have an outlet, so it's dead. It just turns into salt and nothing can grow there. So we have to have this incoming and outgoing and that means change things change all the time in our lives and God is a living God he's not a dead God so he's living and he's constantly changing things in our lives so in verse uh, 6 he says there are diversities of operations but it's the same God who works all in all but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit everyone to profit with all it's for the body for, so to one, one person gets the spirit of the word of wisdom. So just to kind of explain that, we don't have to say, oh, I have a word of wisdom for you. I mean, somebody just tells us their problem, and all of a sudden the answer comes into our mind. And we just speak that. That's a word of wisdom. It's a, it's a direction from the Lord that shows us where to go. And my, most of mine come from Scripture. Where I had a guy today that I uh, talked to, and he said, man, I just don't know what to do. And I said, let me boil down Colossians 3.15 for you. Great word of wisdom. It says, let the peace of God rule your heart, and be ye thankful. To the which we are called, and be ye thankful. So I said, so let me boil that down for you. No peace, no go. God's peace, go ahead. So you wait for God's peace. If you don't get God's peace, you stay put until you do get God's peace. Because otherwise, if you just move on your own, you've got to come back and fix what you broke. And that's through lots of mistakes I've made. So I have learned no peace, no go. And when all of this craziness came about our land in March of 2020, my peace went away when people started saying this, that, and the other about it. And I just said, I'm not believing any of it. I'm just going to wait and see what God shows me. So... Let's go on. To one is given the Spirit, the word of wisdom. To another one, he gets the word of knowledge. Now, the word of knowledge is different than the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is a directional gift. The word of knowledge is something we could never know. It's something that God speaks to us supernaturally that we would never know. 
and we can't even figure it out. And it kind of goes with uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11 that says, God makes everything beautiful in His time. But He has put the world in our hearts, the sons of men, not to know the work that God is doing from the beginning even to the end. We cannot know what the Lord is doing because His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts... I've, I've wondered often for the last several months, Lord... Isn't it time to expose all these lies? And I don't get an answer. You know why? Because God doesn't have to answer to me. He knows exactly what He's doing. He has a plan. It's a good plan, not an evil plan. But it's His plan. And we would never know it, even understand it, if He explained it to us. So the best... Okay, there's a a story in the Bible that uh, this army came against a king. And the first thing he did is he took it before the altar, laid it before the altar and prayed to God and said, what should we do? And God said, send out the army, send the singers and the the praise people first. So I forget what king it was. Was it Hezekiah or whoever it was? I'm not good at names. I just know what happened. So they sent out the praise people singing praises to God and the enemy was defeated before they ever got to him. And how about Gideon? who surrounded a camp of 180,000 Midianites, well, some Bible versions say 185,000, with 300 people. And I tried to figure that out in my mind. Okay, so there's about 135,000 people in Santa Maria. Pretty big area. Let's shrink it down to where all of them could fit. If you took 300 people and surrounded them, how far apart would they be? And I figured at least a quarter of a mile apart to surround that many people. So these guys were a quarter mile apart and they never took one step forward or one step backward. All they did was stand, which is what God's commanded us to do now, just stand and see the salvation of the Lord. They stood, they broke the lanterns, they screamed uh, Gideon and the sword of the Lord. All them guys came out of their tents and killed each other. Who does that? God wiped them all out by themselves wiping them out. So does that make any sense to you at all? Not to me. But you know what? God's ways are higher than our ways. So God knows exactly what He's doing. Verse 10. To, uh, to, verse 9. To another one, He gets faith by the same Spirit. To another one, He gets the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. I've had some somebody tell me, Oh no, I got faith because I study a lot and I hear the word a lot and I believe a lot. No, it's a gift from the Lord. The Bible tells us that in Romans 12, 3. Let no man think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but let every man think soberly according to the measure of faith which God has given to every man. So God gives faith. We just have to walk in it. Amen? That's what we have to do. So faith comes to one. Another one gets, gets the gifts of healing. There are no healers. God is the healer. I've heard people say, I'm a faith healer. No, you're not. You're believing God to answer your prayers, and God is the one who heals. I mean, read James chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, but it is the Lord that raises them up. Only God heals. I can't even make one hair black unless I get hair dye. You know what I'm saying? So we can't heal anybody, but what we can do is we can believe God, lay hands on them, and believe God's promises that they'll be healed. So, uh, to another one, working of miracles. To another one, prophecy in other words speaking forth the truth of God to another one discerning of spirits I know someone who has the gift of discerning of spirits and they have been 100% accurate every, even though I disagreed every single time it's amazing what they've come up and said I'd be real careful about that individual right there in our men's Bible study over the last 27 years and I said, oh man, I don't, they're such a nice person and on and on and on. And it turns every single time they pick them out. I don't even know how they, it's a gift. It's just they can discern the spirit. They can discern it. That's a gift. Then there's a different kind of tongues. 
and to another the interpretation of tongues. So when does that get distributed? Well, obviously when people need to hear it in their own language. So I have a friend who comes from back in Oklahoma, so he's got that twang, and he had his friend who goes to a Hispanic church in Guadalupe, and this is probably 15 years ago, who visited his church, and then his Hispanic friend said, I want you to visit my church. And he said, well, they speak in Spanish. I don't know Spanish. And he said, come anyway. So he went, and the preacher preached, and he sat there like a bag of hammers. <laughs> I don't know what they're saying, but he sat there through the service, and he, he told me, he said, he felt God's Spirit moving. He felt the joy of the Holy Spirit. He just didn't know what they were saying. So at the end of the sermon, the pastor asked him, would you close us in prayer? And he told his Spanish friend to tell the pastor, I don't speak Spanish. I don't, the, nobody's going to understand me. And he said, just go ahead and pray. So he said he prayed in English. God, thank you for me being here. I really felt your love here. These people obviously love you. And he just prayed this prayer and ended. And he said, afterwards, this little Oaxacan woman about that tall walked up to him, grabbed him by the hand and had his friend interpret to him, asked him, where did you learn the dialect of my village in Mexico? That lady heard that English prayer in her own dialect. And you know what? That's in Scripture. That's in Acts chapter 2. We're going to be studying that. Where these disciples spoke in another language. Uh, they were Galileans. They spoke in another language. And there were people from all around the world there. People from, from Ethiopia. People from Italy and Greece and all these other places. And they all heard them in their own language. So it would be like if I speak Greek to you and you hear it in your native language wherever you're from. That's not only a gift of speaking, it's a gift of hearing. And that's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. Well, what the Corinthians were doing was bragging about it. Well, we have this gift and you don't... And Paul just rebukes them for it. And he writes this chapter and says, uh, all these work together so that one and the self-same Spirit giving to each man as he wishes, it's not up to us, it's up to him. He'll give us what we need at the time. As the body of Christ is one, but it has many members. Amen? Hey, we're one body, but look around at all the people. We're many members. We all have different gifts. And all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now watch verse 13. That's kind of where I was wanting to get to. For by one Spirit are we all. How many is all? All? Hey, when I was a young Christian, somebody told me, you're not saved. I, at the time, I was going to a church called Fundamental Baptist Church. That's where, your mom, where I met your mom and your sister. And they said, you're not saved. And I said, are you serious? I know I'm saved. And they said, no, you're not. Not unless you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit speaking with tongues. And I said, that's not even scriptural. And they said, well, I speak in another language. You don't. So that means you don't have the Holy Spirit. And I just said, you are puffed up. And you need to start reading the Bible because the Bible says those of you who compare yourselves among yourselves are not wise. If you're not wise, you're a fool. I said, I'm going to leave it right there. And I turned around and walked away. And it was much later they actually read the scripture and came back and said, you're right. I'm puffed up saying, I'm of Paul and you're of Apollos. And they got it. The Holy Spirit showed them. We can't go around doing that. That is not of God, and it's not walking in love. By one Spirit are we, how many? All baptized into one body. Whether we're Jew or Gentile, whether we're bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Because the body is not one member, but many members. Now, if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I guess I'm not part of the body. Is it therefore not part of the body? Hey, try walking on your hands. See how that works. Especially at our age. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. I can crawl, but to walk on my hands, that is, you know, 
There's no way. Now, if the ear says, well, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body. Is it therefore not part of the body? You're not going to hear the railroad train coming unless you're looking for it if you just want everybody to be an eye. If the whole body was an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body was hearing, where's the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, as it pleases Him. Shouldn't He, after all, it's His body. You know, hasn't God put us where He wants us to be? You know, i got to be honest with you. Not in a million years would I have ever guessed or even believed that I would stand behind one of these and share the Word of God. Not in a million years. I started a Bible study in Avila Beach because my church blew up. Unfortunately, the pastor got into some trouble. The people reacted in a wrong way, and it started division, and my church just went kaboom. And I was just a baby Christian. But I knew it was right to study the Bible, and I knew it was right to tell other people about Jesus. So I found a guy in Avila Beach who was saved, but nobody ever discipled him. And I thought, well, praise God, the teacher learns the most, so I can go up there and teach him about the Bible, and I'll be in fellowship. So that's what I did. And then his friends got saved and baptized, and then his wife got saved and baptized, and then 27 other people got saved and baptized, and then they came up with the bright idea, why don't we start a church? And I said, I've already been in one of them, no thanks. (laughs) This is worse than any bar fight I'd ever been in, Joe. It was bad. I mean, people yelling at each other, getting upset with each other, little kids crying. It was crazy. So they started the church and asked me if I would go ahead and teach until they found a pastor. So I did that for 10 years. And uh, (laughs) I never asked for that. God did that for me. And it wasn't something that I said, I think I'll be a teacher. No. I just didn't want to get beat up no more. So I went up there to talk to one guy and it ended up being a whole bunch of people. That's the way God does things. It's not about what we want, it's about what He wants. Amen? So, there are diversities of gifts, that's verse 4, differences of administrations or operations, uh, verse 5 and 6, in order to profit everybody for the common good. This same Holy Spirit came at Pentecost at Caesarea and at Ephesus as the agent of Christ who baptized the believers into his body. So let's, let's see if that's, that's true. Amen? So let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. So we're in Acts chapter 1 right now, but I just want to jump to 2. Verses 1 through 13. Okay, so when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, I never really understood that. Jack, correct me if I'm wrong. It was after Jesus was with them for 40 days, and then he was taken up into heaven after that. After, uh, because Jack went to Bible college and he studied all that stuff. so, So I rely on Jack and Sandra to point me the right way. But So this is after Jesus left. So he'd been with them for 40 days. He'd done all these miracles. And then they saw him rise up into the clouds and disappear. So it was after that, on the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Boy, you got to preach on that for an hour. One accord in one place. This is why God is blessing this body and other bodies in this city. Because we've started to learn, if we don't stand together, we're going to fall. You know, the house that's divided against itself cannot stand. We have to learn as a body of Christ to stand together. Amen? We've got to stand because we've got a majority against us as Christians. We're the bad guys now. So we've got to learn to do that. So they were in one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came this sound from heaven. It sounded like a, a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. So, what did they do to cause this? Absolutely nothing. They were in one place, sitting there. And they were waiting on the Lord. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire, and it sat upon each one of them. Now, I picture that as kind of like static electricity, like this 
you know, sometimes when static electricity, you touch somebody's hair and it goes like that, and you can see just a flash, uh, something power from God that looked like flames that landed on top of each one of them, God's power. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the word tongues is the Greek word glossoria, which means languages. So they were speaking in these languages that they'd never spoken in before. Kind of like my buddy that went up to Guadalupe, speaking in an Oklahoma accent, and this little Oaxacan woman from Mexico said, Wow, beautiful prayer. Where did you learn the dialect of my village in Mexico? What? That's the Holy Spirit. So it says, um, there, there were dwelling in that place in Jerusalem, there were Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So this is the, the time when people gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover and there were people from everywhere, from Ethiopia, from Italy, from Asia, from Greece, from all these different places. And they had all gathered into Jerusalem. And the Bible says, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded. Well, I would be. I mean, Jack, if I got up here and spoke in German, which ich spreche ein bisschen, Deutsch, and, and people started hearing in in the Mexican language, and the French language, and the uh, Indian language, and all the different languages, wouldn't you be confounded? How's that happening? Okay, so they were confounded. Because every man, how many men? Every one of them heard them speaking in his own language. So the Russians heard him in Russian. They weren't speaking Russian. The, 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 the Greeks heard him in Greek. The the, the the Jews heard him in their language. Everybody heard him in their own language. Does this make sense to you? Right out of the Bible. Verse 7. They were all amazed, and they marveled, saying one to another, Aren't these all who were speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear every man in our own tongue where we were born? How did that happen? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and in Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya around Cyrene and strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes and Cretes and Arabians, we hear them speaking in our own tongues about the wonderful works of God and there's the point. They weren't saying, look at me how spiritual I am. They were speaking about God's wonderful works. They were witnessing. They were sharing what God is an amazing God in everybody's language. And they were all amazed. And some doubted. And said one to another, I love this verse in King James, what meaneth this? <laughs> I've said that so many times to God. What meaneth this? <laughs> It's kind of like what they said to Jonah when he was in the bottom, bottom of the ship. Remember that? What meanest thou, O sleeper? <laughs> Remember that? What are you doing here? What are you meaning by this? Others mocked them. You know, we're always going to have mockers. We're always going to have people that are going to mock the truth. So let them mock. The Bible says in the last days, mockers will come. So others mocked and said, these guys are drunk. But Peter stood up with the eleven. He lifted up his voice and said to them, You men of Judea and all you who live at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and listen to my words. These people are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's only the nine o'clock in the morning, the third hour of the day. Jewish day starts at 6 a.m. So it's only nine. Okay, it was a good thing it wasn't today. Because I've seen people drunk at 7.30 and they got up at 7. Okay, that wine in those days you had to drink all day long. The alcohol content in that wine was not strong enough to get you drunk unless you, that's why the Bible says in Proverbs, don't tarry long at the wine when it moveth in the cup. For afterwards it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. That, they had to get all day long in order to get drunk. 
He said, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass, this is Joel 2, 28, by the way, it will come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, because remember there were women up there too of the 120. Amen? And I know some denominations, no, they were baking cookies. They're not allowed to do anything. Baloney. Women are all throughout the Bible. In fact, in the American church, if you removed all the women, good luck. Because there's way more women in church than there are men. So... God is no respecter of persons. There's no male or female in Christ. So he says here, I will, on my servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they will prophesy. What were they doing? They were speaking in tongues, prophesying. Prophesying means speaking the truth about God. They were speaking about all the wonderful works. We think that's fortune telling. I've heard uh, in some churches that I've been in, okay, we're going to do popcorn prophecies. You, stand up and prophesy to him. Oh, baloney. You know, God's Spirit is the one who truly prophesies. And I've heard enough prophecies this year to make me sick. And none of them came to pass. So it's like, you know what? I'm going back to God's Holy Bible. And until I see things happen that people say are going to happen, I'm not believing it. Because God says that in the scripture. If a man saith, thus saith the Lord, and the thing that he saith cometh not to pass, you may surely know that that man has not heard from God. Now, are we going to believe God, or are we going to believe the... Well, you know, I was off by a few months, but God's late. (laughs) He's never late. I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood, smoke, and fire, vapor of smoke, And the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you men of Israel, you better hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken him and by your wicked hands you crucified and killed him. Wow, Peter, that's pretty bold. Yeah, Proverbs 28.1. The children of God, the believers, the righteous, are as bold as a lion. But wicked people flee when no man pursues. So yeah, God gave Peter that boldness and he spoke it out. And do you know how many were saved that day in that sermon? 3,000 and later 5,000. 8,000 people saved with two sermons. How would that be? That's power. That's God's power. So, that's Acts chapter 2. Now, uh, we're going to have to stop on page 1 and just do page 2 next week. Okay? And I'll reprint this, so if you lose your notes, it's okay. All right, so the same Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, and we see this occur in Acts 2, which we just did. How about Acts chapter 10? Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 46. And when we get to the end of the page here, we'll go ahead and close the service tonight. Acts 10, verse 44. It says, Now while Peter was yet speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. Well, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Verse 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on, even on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speaking with tongues and magnifying God. And then Peter said, Can any man forbid water that these would not be baptized who have received the Holy Ghost as well as us? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. I had a friend named John Bennett. Do you remember John, Sandra? Did you ever meet John Bennett? He was the head of the full gospel. Rick knows him. Yeah, he, we, we used to fellowship with him all the time. John was a, a, loved the Lord. L- man, what a witness for God. So he was in New Mexico, and he was filling up his gas tank. Uh, he went for an elk hunt, 
And so he was coming back and he stopped at this gas station. There's a lot of American Indians in New Mexico. And so he stopped and there was this Indian gal who had gotten out of her car and she was just leaning over the back end of her car, just crying her eyes out. Just crying her eyes out. And John said as he was filling up his gas tank, just the Spirit of God came on him like, you need to pray for her. You know, and uh, he, he said, this is all I remember. He said, I went over and, and put my arm on her shoulder and I said, I'm not here to hurt you. God has sent me here to pray for you. And he said he just prayed like we prayed tonight. He prayed in English. After he was done praying, she turned around and looked at him with shock in her eyes and said, where did you learn Hirakawa Apache? And he said, excuse me? And she said, you just prayed for me in Hirakawa Apache. That's the tribe I belong to. And John said they just rejoiced and praised God and he got in his car and left. Hallelujah. I know God does stuff like that, but it has to be God. And it's not about look how spiritual we are. It's about look how awesome God is. Amen? So then you got Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. And the Bible says, As I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell upon them as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And to speak it on our terms, you will be put into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes there's all kinds of different signs when that happens. I led a guy to the Lord in the San Luis County Jail, and he ran around his jail, jail cell just screaming and saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God just got in his feet. I remember when, that, when I brought the Pepsi guy to our church when I was driving for Coca-Cola, and I just thought it'd be cool to show up in my Coke uniform, bring the Pepsi guy. So I brought the Pepsi guy, Ron, and he got saved. And then Ron, my friend Ron, uh, talked to him, Ron Bailey, into coming back and being counseled about baptism. So when I saw him come to the stage to, to get baptized, God got my feet. I jumped up and ran around the building and came back in and was just blessed beyond belief. And my Baptist pastor said, what happened to you? And I said, I guess I just got so excited I had to run. It's kind of like Forrest Gump, you know. Just, just had to run. And it, I was happy. And God got into me in whatever way He could communicate with me. It's not weird, but then when we try to practice that, okay, if we're all spiritual, let's run around the church and hang off the chandeliers. No. It's not about that. Okay, then uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. So Acts 19.1 says, It came to pass that while Apollos, Apollos was the Greek, and he was mighty in the scriptures. Okay, This man knew the Bible. So Apollos was at Corinth, and Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and he found some certain disciples. And he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We haven't even heard if there's a Holy Ghost. <laughs> okay? So they believed, but apparently they didn't believe what God had for them. So he said to them, Unto what then, how were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. In other words, we just were baptized in water. We just went and got baptized. Then Paul said, John truly baptized you with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, who should come after him, that is Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost, now see, here's another way God did it. He didn't do this every time. Remember when they spoke, the other people were filled with the Holy Ghost. When they were sitting in the room, nobody laid hands on them. So we, now we try to make a doctrine out of, let's lay hands on them and they'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. No, you can't do that. We just have to let God move as God moves. Remember the lady that came up here and just fell on the floor? 
Do you know that she's strong Catholic? Did you know that she said, I didn't even feel myself fall? I was shocked. I was praying for other people. I looked over, she's on the floor. The first thought that came to me is, oh boy, we lost her now. She ain't come back to this church. And so afterwards, I went back there to talk to her just to kind of find out, are you okay? Because she's real tall. She's about six foot. And then when she fell on the ground, she said, I'm great. I think God healed me. She said, I didn't even feel myself fall. I was surprised when I opened my eyes and I was on the ground. Like, what am I doing on the ground? You know, nobody pushed her down. I asked her about that. No, nobody touched me. I just fell to my, the ground. Joe, were you up here with us praying when that happened? Were you in that thing when she fell? Did anybody push her? She just went down. Hey, if God wants to do what God wants to do, then let God do what he wants to do. Amen? Amen. So when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with glossodia, tongues, and they prophesied. Now, what do you think prophecy was? Speaking the wonderful works of God. They were talking about God's goodness and God's grace. And all the men were about 12 of them. And as he was in the synagogue, he spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. I like that verse. He didn't just go in there and preach. He also went in there and disputed. In other words, he confronted the lies, corrected them, and spoke the truth. And that's what we need to be doing nowadays. Now we're in a war. We were at peace for a long time, or at least we thought we were. Actually, we've been in a war since Adam and Eve. We just didn't recognize we're in a war for the last 50 years, and now we see it plain and true. So in verse 9, the Bible says, when, when different people were hardened or offended, and they didn't believe, they spoke evil of that way before the multitude. So he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all those who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Wow. God bless Paul. So it's something that we experience that Jesus Christ does for the purpose of joining all the believers into his body. You know what I think is really cool? When you meet another Christian that you've never met before. So I, I want to tell you a story, and I'll try to make this really short. I was invited to go to Washington to speak to the black sheep up there in, in the northeastern part of Washington, north, northwestern part. So I went up there, and there were probably 50 or 60, and I spoke, and it was all weekend, and I shared my testimony and preached and taught. I was just tired. I was just tired. When I got back down to uh, wherever I was to fly home, I think it was Seattle, when I got to Seattle, I was tired. And I just said, Lord, I preached my heart out this weekend. I am tired. I just want to sit by myself in a plane and be at peace. I don't want to... I don't want to be bothered anymore this weekend. So I sat down alone. And right before the plane took off, this Jesuit priest came in from Africa and sat right next to me. <laughs> it was like, I'm not saying a word. So I just sat there and he sat next to me and he nodded and I said, hello. And uh, I looked over and he was reading the Bible. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. And so we literally preached for two hours on the way back to L.A. And everybody around us heard the gospel. And he was a Jesuit priest from Africa who came to Los Angeles to, to speak to them more perfectly the ways of Christ. That's unbelievable. You know, so a lot of times we say to God, I'm not doing that. That is a huge mistake. Don't do that. Because God will make you do it. <laughs> okay. Just two scriptures and we'll close here. Galatians chapter 3. I hope you've had a good as time as I have tonight. <laughs> I'm really encouraged. Galatians chapter 3. By the way, the teacher learns the most. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 29. For you are all, how many is all? Can't come to you and say you're not saved because you don't have my gift. Amen. That's being puffed up. 
So you are all the children of God by your faith in Christ Jesus. That's how we become children of God. Verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, who does that? God. How does he do it? Through the Holy Spirit. You have put on Christ. So there's neither a Jew or a Greek or bond or free. There's neither, here it is, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed, and you are heirs according to the promise. I've sent Christine's uh, testimony all over the place. When she got up here for 10 minutes and shared her story, blew me right out of my seat. I was blown away. You look at her, and she's the mother of three beautiful little girls, and you think, oh, she's, you know, kind of had a good life. It's like, then you hear about it and you go, wow, God, you did an amazing thing with her. So each one of us have that that's been done in our life. Each one of us have had an amazing connection with the Lord. Amen? So I want to just go back to one scripture and we're close. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I think the point tonight, at least the point God made with me, by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we're a Jew or a Gentile, whether we're bond or free, we have been all made to drink into one spirit. Praise God. Father, I thank you for the teaching tonight. Uh, I know we've gone a little bit long, but Father, uh, you're so rich. And Lord, here I thought we could get at least through two verses. (laughs) You are so awesome, Lord. I learned so much tonight. And I just pray tonight that we would just take these things into heart. And really, truly, Lord, that we would all understand, truly, after all the debate, all the discussions, all the confrontations and everything else, love is the greatest of all. So help us, if nothing else, help us to just walk in love. And love's not necessarily just a gushy feeling, Lord. We know that sometimes it's correction. Sometimes it's rebuke. Sometimes it's teaching. Sometimes it's whatever you want it to be, as long as it's done with the motive of love. So I just ask that you bless us tonight as we take our time to fellowship in the back. And thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Praise God. Amen. God bless you, church.